This equation, formulated by Einstein, explains the scientific principle underlying all nuclear weapons. In this equation, E is equal to energy. M is equal to mass. And C is equal to the speed of light. Since the speed of light is expressed in very large numbers, approximately 30 billion centimeters per second, or 186,000 miles per second, it is evident by this equation that even a small mass can be converted under the right circumstances into a tremendous amount of energy. This energy is released as a nuclear explosion. Its destructive yield may range from the equivalent of a few tons of TNT to millions of tons. Like thunder, the sound of a nuclear explosion follows the flash of light. Because of their destructive power, these weapons may produce mass casualties, casualties far in excess of our medical resources. The purpose of this film is to review briefly the types of injuries which may occur and to help reduce the number of casualties by explaining what evasive action can be taken in the event of a nuclear weapons attack. The energy released according to this equation results from one of two basic nuclear reactions, fission or fusion. Historically, the first of these to be applied to a nuclear weapon is fission. Fission results when the nucleus of a heavy, unstable atom is struck by a neutron, a subatomic particle. The target atom splits into two smaller atoms with a release of nuclear energy and some other neutrons. The phenomenon of atomic fission makes it possible to produce an atomic chain reaction. This occurs when neutrons released from one fissioned atomic nucleus collide with other nuclei. If billions of atoms are present in the reaction, billions of atomic explosions take place, instantaneously and with intense heat. The heat created by a fission reaction makes it possible to utilize a fusion reaction in order to produce a thermonuclear or hydrogen bomb of much greater destructive yield. Fusion occurs when hydrogen atoms are fused together in the presence of enormous heat to form helium. In fusion, as in fission, the new atom weighs less than the original atoms, and the loss of mass is turned into energy according to the equation of Einstein. This energy is dissipated in three ways, as heat, as blast, and as ionizing radiations. These are the factors which will produce injury, singly and multiply, to exposed persons. These are the factors of concern to all medical personnel who will be responsible to prevent, minimize, and manage the casualties of a nuclear attack. First, let's evaluate the factor of heat. At the instant of detonation, there is a characteristic flash, or whiteout. This is heat millions of degrees of heat. The flash is followed by formation of a fireball, whose diameter may vary from several hundred feet to several miles. Within the area of the fireball, practically all substances will be incinerated, fused, or vaporized. Beyond this area, extensive secondary fires will result from the intense heat. Concrete and brick structures will be gutted. Wooden structures will be raised. There will be great loss of life, but not complete loss of life, depending upon the immediacy and effectiveness of medical aid to the injured. Here is a typical flash burn injury. Some areas, such as the collar line, the nostrils, and portions of the ear were shadowed from the flash and escaped injury. 
Here is another flash burn. This shows that the area of injury is in direct line of sight of the thermal radiation. A different type of thermal injury is a flame burn caused by secondary fires. These will range in severity from mild burns of extremities to extensive whole body burns. Many of these injuries from flash and fire can be prevented by proper evasive action. In event of a nuclear flash, exposed troops must immediately protect themselves from the flash and then from the blast. What about this factor of blast? The blast, or shock wave, travels at a speed of one mile in five seconds. Its sound may be a sharp report or a low rumble, depending on atmospheric conditions and terrain. The blast, or shock wave, is caused by the sudden compression and release of air surrounding the expanding fireball. Its pounds per square inch pressure depends upon the yield of the weapon. Moreover, any shock wave may be reinforced by its reflection from the Earth's surface. The reflected wave catches up with the initial wave and gives it an extra punch. This punch will exert its greatest damage in built-up areas, in cities and towns whose structures will be blasted to bits. These bits, fragments of debris, will be hurled helter-skelter in all directions, like shrapnel. It is these flying fragments, rather than the overpressure of the blast wave itself, which may be responsible for many casualties. Other injuries may occur when people are simply picked up by the blast and thrown. Injuries due to blast may range from mild to massive. Here is a mild injury, an abrasion produced by flying sand or dirt. A similar injury would be caused by being skidded along the ground by the force of the blast. These injuries were caused by small flying missiles, bits of glass or concrete, or splinters of wood. They are typical penetrating injuries with the possibility of severe internal hemorrhage. This patient was also mildly burned. Combined injuries such as this may account for many casualties. Other injuries which may occur are sucking wounds of the chest. Any penetrating wound of the chest requires immediate attention. Crushing injuries may be common, especially among people trapped in buildings. Massive soft tissue and bone injuries of the extremities may be expected. Traumatic amputation caused by flying glass and metal may account for many other casualties. However, many of these injuries due to blast may not occur if adequate evasive action is taken in event of a nuclear attack. Built up areas, barracks or houses should be avoided. In open areas, troops should first cover their faces to protect themselves from flash. And then they must hit the dirt for protection from the blast which follows. Finally, let's take the factor of ionizing radiations. In any nuclear explosion, four different ionizing rays or particles are emitted. Of these, gamma rays and neutrons are of greatest immediate importance. Within the first 90 seconds of a nuclear explosion, gamma rays and neutrons are emitted as initial radiations. Each has great penetrating power and can kill a man as surely as heat or blast. In addition to initial radiations, there are residual radiations occurring as radioactive fallout. Fallout may become a major problem. Following a subsurface or surface burst over land or water, dirt and moisture are drawn thousands of feet into the atmosphere, forming a cloud which is heavily contaminated with radioactivity.
Depending upon weather conditions, this cloud could travel many miles downwind from the site of detonation, depositing radioactive fallout on large areas of the countryside. These areas may remain hazardous for days, weeks, or months, depending on the severity of the contamination. As we saw earlier, when a neutron strikes the nucleus of a target atom, the atom fissions and a chain reaction takes place as other neutrons strike still other atoms. This reaction occurs only in certain heavy, unstable atoms. However, by another type of nuclear reaction, any familiar substance may become radioactive to one degree or another. This is called induced radioactivity. Here's an example. This represents the nucleus in an atom of carbon or some other familiar substance. Here is a neutron. Under certain conditions, the neutron may be captured by the target atom, which then becomes atomically unstable. It doesn't fission, but it does emit beta particles and gamma rays. It has become radioactive and therefore capable of producing injury. Ionizing radiations cannot be detected by ordinary human senses. Special detection devices must be used to determine that radioactivity is present and also to indicate its intensity. There are several different types of radiation detection instruments and all medical officers and other medical department personnel should be familiar with their use. Radiation injuries vary in severity from mild to fatal. In mild cases, there may be transient nausea and vomiting, followed by temporary loss of hair. In more severe cases, there is injury involving the blood-forming organs, which may express itself by the appearance of multiple tiny hemorrhages, as seen on the skin of this atomic explosion casualty. More serious injury can be seen in the experimental animal exposed to lethal doses of radiation. This is the intestinal tract of one such animal showing extensive hemorrhage. Similar injury can be expected in human victims of severe radiation exposure. Evasive action to be taken against radiations as against nuclear blast and heat requires adequate shielding Protection against alpha and beta particles is provided by almost any thin material, such as cardboard, plywood, or sheet metal. Clothing alone provides protection against alpha particles. Gamma rays pass through such materials and are not completely stopped even by many thicknesses of them. And neither are neutrons. Neutrons are stopped by substances with high hydrogen content such as water. Gamma rays are stopped by dense materials, such as lead, concrete, and earth. Radioactive decay of fission products, fallout, is another protective factor. Radioactivity decays naturally so that about 10% remains after 7 hours, about 1% after 48 hours, and about one-tenth of 1% after 2 weeks. To summarize, even in nuclear warfare, survival may depend on a classic military principle. That is, survive by taking advantage of time, distance, and dirt. Take time to allow residual radiations to decay. Put distance between yourself and hazardous radioactivity. And hit the dirt to protect yourself from flash and blast. By doing this, you may evade injury by nuclear weapons and remain fit to help those who have not.